You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. This podcast is sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, Boss Shot Shells, and Onyx Hunt. I've been asked many times, why do you do things at the level that you're doing them, right? Why does any NAVDA member that's involved heavily at the local or international level just continue to give their time? And it's because of those experiences. I mean, we all enjoy, you know, seeing our dogs perform and then taking them hunting and seeing that performance pay off in hunting. But it's those memories you're going to make. It's the journey that you have with people that you're friends with, right? It's just really something special. And, and, and I've told many times to Amanda and other of my close friends, like we always have to make sure that we're keeping that in perspective, that it's about, that's what we're going to remember, right? We're going to remember the journey, not necessarily, you know, all the accolades or this or that. We're going to remember that process with people. We have so many things coming to fruition at Her Upland right now. It is so exciting. And I promise you do not want to miss out. So be sure to head over to our website, herupland.com, and hit subscribe. We're gearing up to send out our first newsletter, which will be a monthly publication loaded with information on upcoming events, game bird recipes, dog training tips, and so much more. Check out our apparel and swag and the decals with awesome illustrations by Naomi Coates, buffs and wild rags with our custom Her Upland camo design, koozies with a cheat sheet that lists bird species you're hunting with the recommended chokes and boss shot shell size. All of that and more to come at HerUpland.com. Hearing a pro plan with over 500 veterinarians, scientists, and researchers on staff, you can be assured that if you're feeding Purina Pro Plan, you're feeding a diet that is complete and balanced. Every ingredient in Pro Plan serves a purpose, and when a dog food company prioritizes palatability and digestibility to the level that Purina does, you know that not only do dogs love it, but that they're utilizing what they're consuming. Stool is small, dark, and firm. Send me an email or message if you need help finding the ProPlan formula that's best for your dog. I'm heading out this weekend for some pheasant and waterfowl hunting and will be using the Deadly Boss 3-5 Combo Shells. That's one of the many perks of shooting Boss. It's non-tox so I can use the same ammunition in the wetlands as I do in the uplands. And I don't have to worry about a single trace of lead in the food that I provide for my family. Go to BossShotShells.com and get direct-to-consumer, non-lead ammunition delivered directly to your door. Onyx, a resource that I use to prepare for and navigate every hunt. I'm planning to join some friends for a quail hunt down south later this season, and I'm already e-scouting and looking at areas to try out. If you're an elite member of Onyx, you get exclusive invites to their live master classes. I've attended several of them, and just last week they held one on scouting quail and pursuing them more effectively, which was not only timely for me, but it was incredibly helpful. To gain access to these events and receive more discounts through corporate sponsors, become an Onyx elite member by going to onyxhunt.com and use promo code BDB20 to get 20% off. And thank you to partners of this podcast, Siren USA. Make sure you go to sirenusa.com and look at the only full line of shotguns for women. And Dakota 283, the best kennels. I've used them for years and years, and I absolutely love them. Go to dakota283.com and use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for 10% off. My guests today are Andy and Amanda Doak. This couple lives and loves all things bird dogs, hunting, conservation, and NAVTA, which stands for the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. They literally met at a NAVTA training day. For those that have experienced the friendships made through your involvement in NAVTA, you can relate to this conversation about the personal gain that comes not only from those relationships with other people, but also with your dogs. Andy and Amanda's gratitude inspires them to give back to the organization at both local and national levels. I had a chance to catch up with them a couple of months ago at the NAVDA Invitational as they volunteered their time. Andy shares more about why he is currently running for the vice president position of the NAVDA International Board. 
Voting ends on November 16th, and it sounds like the voting numbers are low. So if you're a NAVDA member, please be sure to get your vote in. All right, let's get after it. I feel like it's just kind of a rarity in this space for both husband and wife or, um, you know, two partners, two people that are in doing all these things together, the dog training, testing, and the hunting. And, and I love the dynamics that I can see with other couples that's similar to my husband and I in that same space. And, and so I'm excited to kind of dig into that and what you guys are up to right now. Awesome. (laughs) So share with me, I'm curious, I think Andy, you've gotten into hunting and the dog stuff um, much earlier than Amanda. Is that right? Yeah, I actually, um, some of my fondest memories as a kid was my dad actually uh, taking me along with him. He he and his family, big duck hunters growing up in the coastal part of Maine. And uh, I started at about five years old, um, going out with my dad in a canoe. You know, I was uh, making sure the decoys were in the canoe and all that kind of stuff. If, if we shot ducks, um, and brought them back. Um, you know, I was the guy taking care of the ducks as a little kid. I did that for, for many, many years with my dad. So I, I really developed, um, a love for duck hunting, uh, you know, at an early age, we didn't actually have a dog. We did, we, our household, uh, my mom is actually allergic at the time. She was, she was pretty allergic to dogs, but she's kind of, um, grown out of that. And now my dad do, does have dogs as well. And also participates in NAVDA. Um, and I basically, you know, as a teenager, my dad made sure to take me out and, and hunt, um, with pointing dogs. The first pointing dogs I hunted with were actually German short hairs. And my dad had a friend who had a Brittany. Um, and I just, once I saw that dog go on point for the first time in the woods and not know where that bird was, and then all of a sudden up goes a bird and, you know, you hear the thunder of a grouse, uh, you know, flying, I, that immediately just you know, took over, uh, Mm -hmm. my, uh, desire to want a pointing dog someday. Um, and then, um, here in Maine, uh, there's a couple chapters that actually do, uh, sportsman shows. So I would, I would see those each year, uh, now, now the members, uh, demonstrating what their versatile dogs could do. And then that kind of clicked with me and said, you know, well, wait a minute, I can duck hunt and bird hunt with a pointing dog. And I think now the is the organization for me. And that's the way, that's my direction. I always wanted to do once I got out of college and I could kind of settle in and, uh, you know, had, uh, some time and, and settle into my job. And that's when I decided to get, uh, my first, uh, versatile hunting dog. And what was that? What breed was it? A uh, German short hair. We actually still have her. She's, she's 12. Uh, oh. she's been with us since day one. We, uh, we had a chance to hunt with her this year. You know, she's, she's definitely slowing down, you know, she's just, you know, um, getting up there in age, but it's just, it's always a blessing to be able to take, you know, a 12 year old dog out more and still, still get them birds in their mouth, you know, cause that's mm-hmm. there's nothing better for a, for a dog that likes, um, uh, you know, birds to, to get that retrieve, you know? Absolutely. So would, what have you all done with her in the NAVDA system then? Did you, did you run her a natural ability when she's a puppy? Did you jump yeah. right into it? Yeah, we did. So, um, got right into it, ran her a natural ability and did very well with her there. I moved on to utility. She was a good dog for me as a trainer. Cause she was, I, she was very driven, but also a little bit stubborn too. Uh, she was, uh, a very good dog for me to take through the NAVDA system to learn from, you know, she, she had, she still does have incredible abilities, but I was really kind of honing my abilities as a trainer. Um, I actually tested her four times in utility. Um, and Amanda always, (laughs) she kind of laughs at me, you know, uh, for that, but I'm glad that I did. I think one of the things that I've learned the most from NAVDA is I learned from my failures more than anything. Um, you really don't learn as a trainer if things go really smooth for you. Uh, you don't learn, you don't carry over those difficulties or challenges that you went through to your next dog. So I ran her four times in utility. And um, I laugh. Let me just interject here. I laugh <laughs> because I say you both match each other's stubbornness. Yeah. So Andy was like, we're going to do this. Right. And then they did. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it was not an option. Like it was going to happen. It was, you know, it was, it was something that I just felt, um, you know, I wanted to have a dog that was a really superior hunting dog. And I think that uh, the NAVDA system all the way up to the Invitational um, provides you, if you train dogs to that level, the utility level, and particularly Invitational level, it gives you that dog that's an exceptional hunting dog. Um, so we were fortunate. We, we, uh, we got a prize one with her uh, utility. And then um, this was right around the time I met Amanda. Actually, the same year I ran at the Invitational 2014 in Iowa, we luckily passed the Invitational and she's, she's now a versatile champion. So she's pretty, she's pretty uh, special to us. You know? Yeah. I mean, for your first pointing dog to be a, uh, or your first dog actually, right? Yeah. My first, your first personal dog, first personal dog. And, you know, now we have four, uh, Amanda has two dogs of her own. And I also have an English setter um, that I've uh, trained actually a couple English setters through the Navi utility system. My dad has English setters. Um, we've, uh, my setter that I have now, we just, um, we've run her twice in utility and both times got a prize one on her, uh, in utility. So we're going to be taking her to the invitational in Ohio next year. Awesome. Yep. Excellent. So Amanda, 2014, that's when you, what happened that year? Well, so I, I kind of, I grew up with dogs. Our family always had English setters. And my dad, like hunting was always big in my family. I just, but being, you know, I was raised, I was kind of, we joke that I was the boy my dad never had. So like he had two girls and I just enjoyed doing the outdoorsy stuff. So he got, he had, um, he started out with Irish setters and then he switched to English setters. And then he had one that he really wanted to train to be a good hunter and but back then we didn't really know about NAVDA but um I would always come out and just tag along with him as a little girl and he would let me like just hide in the grass and I could press the button with the release trap and like things like that and I would just name all the quail in the pen and things you know <laughs> like he, but he just let me just do come along and just do what I wanted to do and he always took me fishing and things like that but I didn't actually shoot I, I didn't shoot anything. I just enjoyed, you know, but I was always around it. Like we always had deer mounts on the walls growing up. So it was just natural for me. So when I got out of college, I ended up getting a lab and it didn't occur to me at the time to hunt with him. Um, but he was not a mellow, chunky fat lab. He was like American driven lab. So when he was about five years old, I was like, you know, I bet he would really enjoy the duck stuff. So I ended up getting into like uh, doing AKC stuff with him, just bare, just dipping my toes in the water uh, because he didn't get on his first duck until he was about five. But he, it was like, I had this whole new dog. I didn't even know that was there. I mean, he saw his first duck and it was like, this was his purpose. Um, so that kind of got me into it. So then I started doing just grouse hunting with him and um, and stuff like that. And we did like the just junior hunter stuff, just dabbling. And then, um, I would always go out with my dad and he's like, you know, you should get back into pointing dogs and stuff. Cause the, we did AKC hunt tests, but, um, we had always gone to the sportsman shows similar to Andy and his dad, we would go every year and see the NAVDA demonstrations. And one year, this was 2014, um, we went and he's like, you know, you should get back into pointing dogs and, you know, join NAVDA because they have more of a cohesive, you'll meet people, you might meet friends that do this stuff. Cause he's like, I'm not going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, yeah, you're, you're right. And, it, and so they just had a lot more events and a lot more like different, like training clinics than just showing up and running my dog at the junior hunt test or whatever for the retriever stuff. So, um, I ended up researching breeds and one of the breeds, the breed that I ended up settling on was a poodle pointer. Um, and I kept reading a lot about their personalities and, um, you know, and I had setters growing up and I loved them, but I loved my lab and his, his, he was just had that loyal, uh, like I was the end all be all to him. And so this was kind of a trait that kept popping up when I would research poodle pointers. So I'm like, you know, maybe I'll, that would be an easy transition. So that's how I ended up getting a poodle pointer. Um, and I went 
to, I dragged my dad to the first test. Like, I, you know, let's go, you know, well, first I was going to go to a different chapter, um, but I ended up bringing my poodle pointer to the vet. And one of the ladies that worked there was like, well, you should go to this chapter. It's much closer. So I was like, okay. So it was just by, I had never even heard of that chapter. So it's kind of by chance. So I showed up and I just for the day and the first person I met was Andy. And then that was kind of how it started for us. Like he, you know, we we're pretty much the, like, you know, from start the, of training dogs together. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't tell I was like, are we dating or does he just like helping me with my puppy? I can't really tell. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, just, it, just, it was just natural. And, you know, it just, it was just something that, and it's funny because my dad bought the 20 acres of land originally when I was in like third grade to train dogs on. And now Andy and I own that property and that house that we built. And now we train dogs on it. And so it kind of life kind of comes full circle. I love that. I love that. So you guys were meeting together to train dogs. Mm -hmm. And would you would you go out and grab a bite to eat afterwards or anything? Yeah, that like would... our first official date was fly fishing. So I the 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 deal was that he would help me train my puppy because this was like the first versatile dog that I had. And so he was going to help show me the knob to ropes and then I could show him some stuff because I used to be an avid fly fisher before I got into bird dogs. But um, now that's kind of all I do. But he so I was like, well, I'll take you I'll teach you some fly fishing stuff. And so that was our actual first date. Official date was fly. Yeah, she she took me fly fishing on our first date. So pretty, pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. She's a keeper for sure. (laughs) Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was a good trade bird dog yeah. training and then fly fishing I was hooked on Andy hooked on Navda and the dog <laughs> thing it was yeah. is it still the same chapter that you guys are a part of now yes yep in Sebastica okay. chapter, chapter which is in uh Smithfield Maine central part of the state um okay. there's actually three chapters in Maine you know one of the 96, 97 chapters now that are in NAVDA across uh, the U.S. and Canada, all over the place. Um, so we're we're one of those one of the one of those mixed in with all the NAVDA chapters available to people. Yeah, talk a little bit about what you guys are doing at your local level with with NAVDA because you've been in that chapter for how long now? Almost uh, I, ten years. I've been in there since twelve I years. Started. Yeah, it's about fifteen years. I've been. Um, you were volunteering before you got a dog. Yeah, I actually, um, I actually was part of NAVDA for two years before I even had, um, you know, the, the short hair that, that we spoke of. And um, that actually, because what was happening was I was waiting for a, a litter um, of puppies that, that, I, that one that I wanted to buy from uh, that breeder. And um, it, it was about a two year period um, where I actually volunteered. I showed up to every single clinic. I never missed a clinic. I still rarely miss a clinic, um, you know, at my local chapter. Um, and that actually afforded me the opportunity to, to probably um, understand what NAVDA was all about without having to worry about my little puppy to watch over, right? I could just enjoy mm-hmm. my time, watch other people, volunteer, go plant birds, offer to do anything and everything. And that's what I did. And I felt that that was... Um, gave me a really good jump start to understanding what NAVDA was about. Um, pretty quickly um, in my chapter, people saw my enthusiasm and then they, they asked me to um, serve on the board of directors for my local chapter. So in that 15 year time period, I've served as I first started as director of testing that position in, in uh, any local chapter really organizes the NAVDA tests for the chapters kind of as an operational uh, role. And then I served for vice president for two years uh, from our chapter. And then for the last eight years, I've actually served as chapter president. Um, so, and this year I've decided that it's my last year and uh, it's time to pass the torch to somebody else and uh, bring in, you know, uh, basically have that opportunity for that new leadership to, to foster and, and somebody, somebody um, can take that and expand the chapter even more than we have currently. So mm-hmm. uh, it's been an exceptional experience. I, and I, I, um, you know, I'm involved at the local level and the national level, 
Um, but I, my time spent at my local chapter is some of the most cherished memories that I have because that's really where those connections and um, stories like me, Amanda meeting up, you know, are, are at the local chapter. Uh, that's where all the really bulk of the things that happen in NAV that takes place at the local level. So, and Amanda's been involved. Um, yeah, I got well. started right away. I got on the board like that first year as director of communications. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'm now going to be stepping down from that role and um, running for the director of training position, which will be cool because that would be like a first, you know, we don't have this, we've had the same director of training um, and he's been amazing. Um, but yeah, it'll be the first time like a girl will be in that role. So it'll be neat. There's yeah. a lot. Of, yeah, there's a lot of people that are really encouraged. For our that, chapter. That, anyway, yeah. You know, Amanda is, um, as a woman, is is taking on that role. And she's, you know, had some very successful dogs herself. And, um, you know, it's going to be um, a breath of fresh air, I think, for a lot of people to see her um, guiding Absolutely. other you know, training their dogs. Yeah, Amanda, I met you um, at the annual meeting in Minnesota. What year was that? I don't even remember. Minnesota would have been twenty the fiftieth anniversary. Yes. Yeah, yeah that was twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Yeah. So yeah, and I met you then. I was like, oh man, this girl is badass. We need to be friends. <laughs> yeah. I think we were, we, had, we were having dinner or something. I yeah. think we were socializing. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And I, actually, I remember her coming back and telling me. I met this with Courtney. She's got these wire hair because yeah. Amanda's obviously, you know, yeah. the wire hair, the wire haired dog connection, right? Yeah. So she was doing the same to me. She was talking to me right up to me. Right? There is a camaraderie of women who own bearded dogs. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Amanda, tell me about your your journey with the dogs then. So you had your first poodle pointer. Yes. And what did you do with testing? Um, that one? So I'm like pretty like type a personality. I had this like goal in mind. I'm like, we're going to prize one in NA. We're going to get a max score. Then we're going to move on and just ace our utility test. And I'm going to go all the way. Um, didn't quite happen that way. Um, <laughs> as the dogs, we went on cricket schedule. Um, so she, we, she wouldn't swim. That was, she was a little timid. Um, she didn't come like out of the box with like a lot of confidence. So swimming was like, she was a little nervous with that. So I had to wait till the following year and um, we tested NA, got a prize three. And of course I left the test sobbing because Aww. I got a prize three and didn't get my prize one that I wanted. Um, but we ended up, I, I retested her and got another prize three and we, she did great in what she didn't do before, but then she flopped <laughs> on other things. So it was just me trying to like navigate, like how, you know, just keeping my emotions in check and just getting, you know, and I think I definitely grew and learned a lot from that because it just spurs you on to like, just do better. And yeah. what, if, you know, so just, so we worked and we did our UT test and then we got another prize three. So I was really upset. Um, but then the next one, we finally got our prize one. And that was so, that was just so sweet to me because it was like, it just, it felt so good. Like just mm -hmm. so, you know, and if I hadn't, if I had just had it easy out of the box, I think that I, you know, wouldn't have learned anything really. Um, but it made me a better trainer. It made me, you know, reading dogs and like work with what you have. And, you know, um, and we've learned, I've had so many great mentors along the way that have just been so instrumental, not only Andy, obviously, but, um, just people taking me under their wing and, and, you know, showing me the ropes and stuff. So we did go on and we got our VC in 2019. Um, and again, I sobbed like a baby, but <laughs> this, good this time. Um, so yeah, it, it's just, we, I have made some of the most special friendships along the way doing this. And so that to me is like a big piece of Navda is what I get out of it is like, you know, and now I love helping people. And when they're upset because their dog, you know, took out birds, I'm like, you know what, my dog did the same thing. 
I've been there. I know how you feel. Right. And you can kind of build people up and help them, you know, that way because you've been there. So that to me is, is such an important thing with NAVDA that it, you, it's not that competitive thing. It's people just genuinely want you to do well. Yep. Absolutely. It's an incredibly supportive group. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that helps with it being, um, a non-competitive venue as well. So, you know, in AKC, there's, there's the hunt tests that are non-competitive. It's against, you know, a standard and, but then you have the field trials, um, and the other, you know, whether it's obedience or agility, they're competitive venues. So I just think that there's a different feel with it. And with the NAVDA system, it's just everybody building each other up. Yeah. I love it. And it doesn't even have to be, um, I think too many times people are intimidated thinking that it's a system for testing only. And, you know, I, we tell our owners, yeah, we would love for you to test, but just go to your local chapter because they're going to greet you with open arms. They're there to help you. And I think they get to that point where they may not have had any interest in testing, but the path and the community that just continues to build them up and support them, they end up doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. and you just never know. I mean, it's, and I always tell people when they show up, you, you don't have to test. Testing mm -hmm. isn't for everyone, but like yeah. you, it, for me, it sets, I like to have goals. I like to meet those goals. So it does help you set a timeline, like, and you know, maybe some nights you're tired, but you get out in the yard because you've got a test coming up. Whereas you may not do that if you, you know, don't have that, you know, kind of goal set for yourself, but you 100%. know, testing definitely isn't for everyone and there's a place for everyone in NAVDA. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Where are you guys at with dogs right now? So you said you have the 12 year old short hair. I heard mm -hmm. you talk about the setter and then you have cricket, the poodle pointer. Yep. And she's eight and a half now. And then, um, I have a new poodle pointer. She just turned two in September. Okay. So, yeah. So where are you at with her? So I tested her in utility and we got a prize too. Um, she took out a bird first one, <laughs> um, surprise, but she did well, she rebounded, but that was, that kept us out of prize one contention. So, but you know, she's a baby, so she wasn't even two yet when I tested her. So, um, I'm going to just enter the test next year and, and keep going, you know, I just enjoy it. And, you know, I'm just going to keep working until, you know, we get, we get there and, but she's, she's a lot different. So I've learned a lot. Uh, I, I feel like she definitely, she has confidence out of the box, but she's a, she's a niece to my, my cricket. So I do definitely see some similarities, but a lot of differences too, mm -hmm. but personality wise, they're very similar. Andy, do you have a setter? Yeah. Yeah, I do. She is five and a half now. Like I mentioned, um, we've run her in utility. Um, actually ran her utility a couple times. It didn't make it to the, I qualified her to go to uh, the Invitational actually New Mexico uh, in Iowa. You know, it's kind of that odd year where uh, we're during COVID in 2020. Um, so we've run her twice in utility, got prize ones on her both times. And, and, you know, like I mentioned, I plan to run her in Ohio, which I'm sure that those running in Ohio will probably love a uh, bleach white setter with a high head and a high tail for backing purposes when you know my brace mate <laughs> but uh she's been a she's a special dog I actually um my dad has two setters as well too he he actually got them before me and I actually trained my father's um setter and also uh got a max score utility with her as well and that was a great um it was a great experience for me actually very different dog there's very few setters that actually run in the NAVDA system in general. It's only about 20 setters per year run in NAVDA. So they're, they're clearly not a common uh, breed, uh, but I just love certain things about them. They're, they're very different, obviously, this, obviously than some of the breeds. And, and I enjoy, um, you know, I enjoy training and watching and judging and seeing a variety of different breeds. Cause I think they all have their, their uh, similarities, but differences. Um, so she's been just a great dog to, to, to work with and train. So that's, that's kind of where we are next with her. And then I'm sure we'll be 
probably in pretty soon we'll be looking to get a new puppy I'm sure and start it it's all his, over it's his turn now so we we're, we <laughs> rotate so every yeah. and we, yeah. don't, we don't share dogs <laughs> right you have your own that's strings how, right that's how yes. our marriage will last yeah. yes like we, we definitely we help each other training and stuff but the rule is that whoever is whoever's running the dog it's ultimately like their choice whether or not they want to take the advice given by the spouse and they don't have mm -hmm. to take it mm -hmm. and the spouse yep. shouldn't get upset when they don't want to take their advice because sometimes <laughs> you do have your own ideas about well, I want to try this or I want to try that and so you kind of just have to I learn by doing and also failing yes a hundred percent that's frustrating as it is but yeah I mean, we definitely we we love training together and so I think we feel pretty lucky too I mean like you said it's unique that spouses um you know same thing for you and bill um it's unique that spouses do this type of activity together it creates unique challenges obviously and usually those challenges are rooted around the fact that the spouse wants to see the other spouse be as successful as they possibly can nobody you know nobody's there the, the biggest cheerleader is you know your counterpart right so um there are many times actually um, where I, I personally have said this to many people, I think Amanda is a better dog trainer than I am. I think most women provide a really unique perspective in the dog training world. And, and there's so many successful women in NAVDA that I would hand my dog over to in a heartbeat to, to train them or hunt them. Um, but, you know, I think that what's rooted is in that is we want to see each other successful. So, there are many, many times when you've probably been in the situation too, Courtney, where it's just one of those days where things aren't, you know, you're frustrated, you come home from work and you got a couple minutes to work and things don't go well. And, you know, Amanda's watching me from the back porch and she's just watching and making her observations. And, you know, it, and then I might even ask her to say, hey, come on, what do you think? You know, give me a hand here. What's, what's your input? I want to hear what you have to say. More often times than not, she's usually got. But it's the helpful, right track, especially you know? with like things like horse fetch and stuff. Just having another person just watch because you may be doing something you're not even aware that you're doing. Right. So just having someone else just kind of say, "Hey, you know, maybe try this, or maybe you know." And and every dog is different, so you know, it's you kind of have to tailor that, and just having another person just to kind of remind you gently. Right. <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you're in those moments of frustration out there with the dog and you're just like why isn't it doing what it's meant to be doing right now it's nice to have that outside opinion mm -hmm. and even though sometimes like not the moment to be telling me <laughs> yeah right. we've, been, we've been through a handful we also have a role <laughs> to do not throw because he's a judge and I'm not so we have a role like do not throw scores at me unless I ask for them <laughs> so I know that was a crappy retrieve. You don't need to tell me what it would have been. I know. Yeah. Or I'll be like, it was a ring grip. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it can, it's, it's definitely something that also we've grown as a couple doing it because it, it was hard in the beginning because you do have to you set have those to set boundaries. Those so you have to, we had to navigate that. And how can we do this together where we're both you know, you know, successful, but yeah, we're both enjoying ourselves and we both feel like, you know, cause for it, for me, it's like, I, I, it's, and I guess, I don't know, like, I'm sure a lot of women feel this way, but I don't want people to automatically assume when they walk up to me that my husband trained my dog. So I may be more obnoxious about, no, I want to do it. I want to do it. And more, you know, headstrong about it because I think, I think, you know, for me, it's, and maybe it's just an insecurity I have, but I, I, it's important to, for me to do it myself. Like I, you know, like I, this is my dog and we're going to be what we're going to be, but it's, you know, something like it's my journey that I would like to do with them. So, but also enjoying it with my husband. So there's, you know, a, a unique balance that's required with training with your spouse. <laughs> this summer was the first time that I tested in utility and trained, um, start to finish utility dog by myself. And I run it, I ran into that as well, Amanda, where 
it was like, oh, well, it's nice that your husband is a dog trainer and, and does that for you. I'm like, yeah, no, he, he didn't, he didn't touch my dog. Actually, <laughs> he definitely was there to offer advice. And, and we went through that. I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want to hear that right now. And those frustrations, but he was also the motivator of like, you need to get out there and train your dog today. Mm -hmm which was nice because I also don't know if it wasn't for his motivation and his support in that. Cause I was, I was psyching myself out. I'm like, I'm not going to be ready. I'm not going to be ready. Um, I'm just going to pull the dog. And I already did that last year. I already psyched myself out a year ago and didn't do it for that reason. And so I was really appreciative that he was like, get out here and do this. And, but now our son, the eight-year-old, I uh, got done with the duck search on a training day and I got done and I was like, man, that I felt really good about that duck search. And my son goes, mom, I think I'd give you a two on that duck search today. <laughs> oh, boy. I was like, and even my husband goes, really, Burke? Like, I would have given that a four. And Burke's like, yeah, I think there could be some improvement there. I'd have liked to have seen him expand a little bit more out to the right side. <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> a little judge in the making. Yeah, right. That's so awesome. <laughs> So Andy, with you being a judge, how long have you been judging? Uh, it's been about five years now. Um, okay. You know, one of the things that I committed myself to doing a lot, you know, is I wanted my, my personal view is I wanted to experience the entire NAVDA testing system before I got into judging. And uh, that's why I really wanted to focus on running my dog all the way up through the invitational before I, I applied for uh, to be an apprentice judge to go through the process of trying to get approved. I, I wanted to uh, experience the testing system, see it all. Um, and I think that that really helped me from a perspective of when I was working and navigating through the apprentice program. So, um, you know, I've been a judge for about five years. Um, recently, it was just accepted into the acting senior program, uh, which is the apprentice program to um, become a senior judge. Uh, so that's sort of the next evolution. The senior judges are, you know, very well respected and been around for a, a number of years, judged a lot of dogs and um, kind of have overall management of the test on the test day um, is really responsible to seniors. So I'll be um, taking on that challenge next. And um, yeah, it's been a it's gr great experience. Um, you know, as a judge, you get to see a lot of different dogs, a lot of different handlers, a lot of different uh, breeds a lot of different parts of the U.S. and Canada. You know, if you get a chance to to be asked to go, you know, out of your area to judge, so it's been it's been a great experience overall. It really has its big time commitment. All our judges know that. Um, you know, our judges don't get paid; they get compensated for their costs to you know travel. But um, it's purely uh, you know selfless volunteer role that many of the people in NAVDA do you know day in and day out. So. Mm -hmm. When Amanda, you had touched on a little bit earlier when you guys are out training together that you're like, don't be, don't be a judge here today. Mm -hmm. Is that like, give me, give me a situation where that has happened, Andy, when you've seen yourself be like, okay, I just need to be here for support for her rather than um, acting as a judge. Do you have any stories there? You do. What are, what are your stories? <laughs> oh gosh. I think there is, there's a couple times when I think Amanda alluded it to it, like retrieving, right? So, you know, we expect the utility dog to, to um, readily go out to shot game, pick up that game and readily come back and present it to the handler. You know, that's a, that's what we can kind of consider a high scoring uh, retrieving dog. And I think her dog cricket was just having some problems that particular day on the retrieves. And then I blurted out, you know, that would have, I don't even remember what the number was, but it wasn't, wasn't a, wasn't a four, right. It wasn't a max score. So it was, and I yelled back, that was a rig rep. Right. And <laughs> I immediately chucked my, I had like my hearing protection. I chucked it on the ground and we took a break yeah. for a hot minute. <laughs> like, and then it was, after that it was like, okay, unless I ask for it, do not just throw scores at me. Right. Mm. So, what, but it is so handy though, having him be a judge, because then I can be like, okay, what would that have, like, how would you have scored that? Like, what are you seeing right. there? And, you know, in terms of numbers and stuff, cause they, I just think it's very handy. 
And I think that that applies to if anybody is helping anybody, right? So it's stressful at times as a handler, if you're the helper, um, particularly the judge, you got to recognize, okay, this is not probably the time to say <laughs> that was not very good, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it, there's, a, there's an art to that, to interacting with people, particularly your spouse more so than anybody to, you know, maybe, maybe we talk about it after we, you know, put the birds away or right. back up. Right. And, and you, you also have to give credit to the handler. I mean, Amanda has been through the whole process. She knows what is good and what is acceptable and what she's looking for in her dog. I don't need to tell her that, you know, she, she, she's experienced enough to know that. And, um, you know, again, it's rooted, in, it's rooted in that core belief that you want your spouse to be successful. So if you see something going wrong, you know, Amanda has done it to me too, but she's, she's more gifted at it than I am. She'll say, here's my advice. You can take my advice and no problem if you don't want. And usually I do now because it's good advice. Um, but um, yeah, those are those scenarios where we we've, we've learned from that. You know, you don't, you never want to not have, why would you want to go out and you know, not enjoy the training with the spouse or anybody that you're with, you know, and you, you have to be, um, you have to be, there's a way about that, you know, in interacting with people that makes those experiences positive. And then the ultimate goal is for positive outcome, right. With the dog and with, with the person that you're helping, you know, so. you were out here West judging. Um, and a couple of my friends ran dogs under you, yeah. And, and they had shared with me, like, just what a great experience it was. And one of them was a very, was a first time handler in, in utility. And, um, she had just commented how gracious you were and, and I think, and, and just helpful and supportive out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wondered like if your personal, you know, your, your relationship with Amanda, seeing her in that space and, um, providing that support. I, if there's some transition that you see in yourself as a judge doing that out in the field differently. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a huge benefit if you have, if your spouse or better half is training with you, cause you see those perspectives, you make different observations about how maybe somebody that's a little bit nervous, like a first time handler, particularly a woman, you know, you want them to have that a good experience. Right. And I think the biggest thing that um, my takeaways from from all this and talking with so many women that are involved in NAVDA is they just want to be treated the same as anybody else. You know, you know that's yeah. And, and why 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 treat them any different? They're you know coming up to the line at, with their dog, and you know they have a hunting dog, and you know they're a hunter. They're going to be a hunter just like anybody else. You know, and and I think um, you know there's about twenty percent of NAVDA members are women. That's a, that's a, that's a high statistic, but I'd like to see that improve. Uh, so, you know, one in five or so, um, you know, people at a NAVDA event that you go to are, are women. I'd love to see that continue to increase. You know, I think some of the women that we have are, like I said, are some of the best trainers. They're some of the best judges that we have. And, and that perspective that they provide is, is, is crucial to the success of the organization. But, but yes, I mean, there's no question that I've, I'd be, I'm more mindful, you know, as, as a judge, as a handler, as a trainer, uh, for anybody that I'm helping out, you know, the way that I may interact with them or just, um, you know, guide them, uh, in their questions. There's, there's definitely stuff that like he's seen along the way that he maybe wasn't aware of before (laughs) he, we got together, um, that he's like, oh, okay. Like seeing things that, maybe a little different, you know, there, there might be a different experience for women than um, men, you know, and it's, I think it's been, you know, definitely you've, it's kind of opened your eyes a little bit yep. before yep. you were with me, like, for you sure. Know, and then after, so for sure. What do you mean by that, Amanda? And because when you say it, I think of the approach and how maybe he would say things because, right. I think like, our, our common term is mansplaining of like, I, I, right. Right. Like I know how to do this. I'm asking for help, like something very specifically, but then they have to go into this whole thing, uh, treating you like you don't know how to do any of it. Right. So or, and, like just that, with a general question, I don't like when I'm 
when I'm like the, the trainer for the day at our clinics or whatever in the UT field, or uh, I don't start out by asking, do you hunt to anybody? I say, oh, what, what bird, like, what do you primarily do for hunting? Mm-hmm. And I say that for a man or a woman. Um, I think just posing that question versus like, do you hunt? <laughs> and, right. and it's like, I have heard that question. And I'm, and I often wondered, is that asked of men when they come out, you know, to, to get help or whatever. And so just little tiny things like that. I think that is just phrasing and just understanding that yes, men and women are different. We're not, not different. No mm-hmm. one's saying that, but we should be able to do the same things and not, you know, I don't need a leg up. I don't need, I'm, you know, not a damsel in distress, but <laughs> just, you know, like just, but just kind of assume that I'm out here for the same reasons. Right. As a man, right. right? So. Yep. Yeah. And I, I have to say like, I'm, it's very new to me really still because I've been around nothing but like incredibly supportive men. Um, I've never really felt that stuff, but yeah, like this summer I was at a training day and, and there was a guy that after I was gunning for a brace, he had said, you shoot pretty well for a girl. And it, it meant it in the nicest, most Absolutely. complimentary way. Always coming from a night. A it's not, <laughs> it <you know. laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was those little things that I think just talking to more women, I'm starting to maybe just now notice where I didn't necessarily notice it before. Um, yeah. Of- and it's, and it, I'm like, I am, de- I'm definitely an insecure. I'm not like the most self-confident person in general. So like, for me, it adds an added layer of like, oh, if I miss this bird, they'll think it's because I'm a girl, right. not because I just right. missed a bird. You know, so, and whether or not they do or not, that's my own internal thing. I know that, (laughs) Um, but it is definitely something that's there. And so I think Andy just is like, just kind of aware of that, Mm -hmm. that he doesn't think about that when he misses a bird, you know, so just little things. I think the biggest, you know, hearing you, hearing you be provided that feedback, you know, by a couple of your close friends that I, I was their handling judge, you know, that really means a lot, right? I, I, it, it. It means that those ladies are going to have a good experience at a NAVDA test for, for all the blood, sweat, and tears that they put into their dog, and they're going to keep going. And they, mm-hmm. they could be the people, the next people that are the leaders of NAVDA at a local level or an international level. And um, that's something that I've always um, cherished and, and enjoyed about the organization, you know, fostering people like that. It's, you know, honestly, it's a pleasure for me. I just it brings a big smile to my face when you see somebody that's a first time handler, uh, NA or utility. Um, you know, obviously people put a lot of work into their utility dogs. Um, just seeing that first time experience. Cause they're going to remember that like forever They're you know, they're, they're going to remember that for years and years and years. And, um, it's just so impactful. It really is. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. I think just kind of an interesting example of that, um, one of the girls showed up to the field that day in a vest that had pink on it. And instead of, instead of blaze orange, and that's how she feels comfortable in that space, whether it's hunting dog training every day, like is she, she likes that color, you know, whether, whether pink is like a woman thing or whether she showed up in teal you know, I don't know that it would have mattered, but, um, I mean, in a lot of States, like pink is allowed, but the feedback I heard was like that you were just supportive, like, yeah, whatever you feel comfortable in, like, it's fine. Like this is what's allowed in your state for hunting. It's a hunting vest and that's it. And then it was actually another woman on the judging team that was like, you're not allowed to wear that pink vest. You need to go back to your truck, you know, like, so like (laughs) what that does, but what that does for a handler of like, you know, just as you're building up your emotion and your momentum and all that anxiety, pushing that out of the way to get there. Um, and then being like, you need to first go back to your truck. <laughs> but I just, I just thought it was interesting. That was a woman that kind of threw that rule in her face and, and that, you know, there were that the men on the judging team were like, Hey, whatever you want to do, it's cool. <laughs> all right. yeah. So I appreciate that in you. <laughs> 
he definitely he's he's that's always been something he's he's just very good at reading people and you know mm -hmm. what else are you guys involved with there are you a part of any like besides NAVD, are you in any AKC clubs or conservation groups or anything in that area? We dog dog world wise. Um, like I said, Amanda mentioned she dabbled a little bit before she got involved in NAVD with her lab, but we've really put kind of our heart and soul in NAVD. And, and honestly, it's a um, it's a balance of our time too. Yeah, we just you know, have time to do um, other stuff. We're being so involved on the local level and myself on the national level you know, it, it's, there's some, I don't think I could actually um, have enough time in the day to do uh, much else in, you know, the dog training and testing world and hunting world other than NAVDA. And it's just the organization, you know, I've preferred over the years. Um, but um, as far as conservation groups, um, we're both all members of, you know, NAVDA sponsors, Pheasants Forever, uh, Quail Forever, Rough Grouse Society. Rough Grouse Society obviously is near and dear to us because we're in the Northeast and grouse and woodcock are primarily the bird species that we have an opportunity to hunt. Um, Ducks Unlimited obviously as well too has been, um, I've been a supporter of them over the years as a member. And, um, you know, as far as doing projects, one of the things, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, my dad uh, got me out of canoe and duck hunted since I was five. Well, at that same age, he was also dragging me around to in the winter to check all our wood duck boxes that we build. So that's been, it's sort of like a childhood thing that I love to do every winter. Um, we have gosh over probably in different properties that either belong to us or belong to family members or our actual local chapter owns our own training grounds. And we recently installed, I think we have 24 wood duck boxes on that, that we, that we now make a winter event to check those wood duck boxes and see how the progress is going. Um, we're talking about putting some hen houses up to, for mallard production. Um, so those are just really fun, you know, give back to, you know, wildlife, um, projects type of thing. We actually, uh, my dad and I are fortunate to own a piece of property in coastal Maine. And we involved when we did a forest management plan, we involved actually one of our NAVDA members who was also a diehard, um, uh, grouse and woodcock hunter happens to be the forester that managed our project. And we also got rough grouse involved, uh, rough grouse society. So we could lay out some specific cuttings that would actually be wildlife, you know, create habitat for, for wildlife. And now we go back to those areas, you know, it's been that eight, 10, 12 year, uh, cu cuttings that have grown up and we're, we're seeing that pay off as far as, you know, producing wildlife. So, you know, it's really all about the whole, the whole world of, you know, hunting, right? Not just hunting, but actually providing. If you have an opportunity to support a conservation group, uh, particularly for the bird species that you hunt. I mean, we're members of Pheasants Forever, but Pheasants Forever does so much for wildlife in general. They are not just about one species of bird. And you, you can see that in the, in the habitat that they create. Um, so it's important to us, you know, we don't get out to the West a lot to hunt, but it's important for us um, to make sure that we support, you know, they really are one of the biggest, if not the biggest conservation groups in the U S and it, as a hunter, you know, go, go support those groups. Cause they're, they're helping you have a, a good day in the field. They really are. I love how you're, you're deep into it and you, that you actually are practicing what you preach because you are, you're currently running for a board position right now for NAVDA. And what, what is the voting period for that? It opened, was it October like? Yeah, October 15th. 15th. It runs okay. for about a month. Actually, our, our bylaws require that election process to uh, be open for a month. So the voting will close on uh, November 15th. Uh, you know, all members uh, were emailed uh, their ballots. They have an opportunity. It's the first time we've actually done electronic voting. So hopefully that's going to get people, uh, have people an easy opportunity to participate in the process. And I think that that's, that's really important. Even if you're a first time, first year member, or you've been a member for 30 plus years, it's really important to participate in that process. But yes, I am fortunate. Um, you know, I've been on the board, uh, the national board, uh, our executive council for five years now as a director of promotions. Um, and, you know, I am really fortunate that my fellow members on that board, um, you know, have seen my work ethic and my drive. And like you said, kind of practicing what you preach and um, encouraged me and asked me to run for the vice president position. So that was, 
Um, that's, that's, uh, if you go to the ballot, look at the ballot, my name's on there and, and my bio and what I'm kind of all about, but, uh, but yeah, I've been fortunate. It's been a great experience and, uh, hope to continue, you know, that support that I provided along with all the other EC members as well. Mm -hmm. How long have you been on the, um, as the director of promotions? Uh, It's been about, this is my fifth year. So we've been, I've been doing this for five years. Uh, prior to that, I was actually asked to manage NAVDA's youth committee. I mean, NAVDA has a very involved youth program, gets kids to uh, encourage them to participate in the testing program, as well as hosting youth events at local chapters. So I was fortunate to run that whole program for about three years and then then was asked um, to be the director of promotions, which, which again, I've done for five years now. That youth program is amazing. And so we had, um, for her Upland, we had a dog training camp this summer. And I mean, it, it was all 100% by the help of that, the NAVDA youth committee that we were able to provide four spots at that mm-hmm. event um, for not only the four youth members, but also their chaperones to be able to attend. And that was really my first time working with the youth committee and you personally, Andy, and it was a great experience. And I just appreciate how you went out of your way, had extra questions and provided additional insight on, on a lot um, and just genuine interest of really what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, I would do that. It's my role to do those sort of things and as director of promotions, but you know, I have a genuine, I think what you guys are doing with her Upland is exceptional. It's just that, you know, the, your, your planning, your execution of some of the stuff that you guys are doing is really just something that's top notch. And um, so I commend you for that. So if we can, we can help in any way, if, if, if even if it's to answer a question or, or whatever it is from the NAVDA perspective, you know, I certainly want to do that. Yeah. I appreciate that. In your role, in your current and um, past roles in the NAVDA organization, what are some of the things that you're most proud of? Well, you know, I think um, there's a real overarching goal that we had as an executive council, uh, which started three, three years ago, which was the development and execution of our strategic plan. So, you know, when you hear the word strategic plan, that is exactly what it is. It's a very thought out, thorough plan that um, you gather input from a variety of stakeholders in the organization, you know, our EC members, our committee members, local chapter members, uh, to develop a really thought out um, goals and um, really, really goals that need to be accomplished to, to move the organization forward. And I was fortunate because I got thrown right into that process. I, when I came on as director of promotions in 2018, uh, the first executive council member uh, meeting that I attended was actually in Chicago, where we were having a sit down uh, meeting with a a third party consultant, you know, that had been uh, coordinated with us to really dive into what NAVDA is all about. You know, it's everybody, rightfully so, has their views and strong opinions um, of what NAVDA is all about, right? And, and you, if you ask somebody different, you're going to get a different answer. But we really needed to take a step back and say, where are we as an organization and uh, what do we need to do to move forward? To, do, to What are our key areas that we need to be the most successful? And so I got involved in that. Um, you know, that was really kind of spearheaded by the board at the time, particularly Marilyn Better, uh, our past president. Um, she was exceptional at, at guiding us through that process and really executing that. Uh, myself and Tim Otto, Tim's running uh, for president, were really instrumental in providing a lot of the detail and and um, uh, points and, and, and really deliverables in that plan. Um, that plan ended up being really kind of boiled down into four strategic priorities, which were to strengthen the organization, provide the best testing system possible, um, educate the members so they get the most out of their dogs, and then improve and expand on branding and marketing, right? So that's four big, big overarching lofty goals. Uh, but I would say within that, one of the key things that NAVDA members, uh, former executive council members have been talking about for many, many, many years now. I was actually talking to a longtime NAVDA member who mentioned Vic Connors, a past president. Vic was really instrumental in setting up the current NAVDA office and really taking NAVDA into a new um, world, you know, as far as 
operationally. Uh, you know, that 15, 20 years ago, people were talking about the fact that NAVA needed a real CEO or managing director or executive director, that type of uh, person. That was one of the main goals in the strategic plan. Um, I'm really happy to say that we executed on uh, recently hiring a managing director um, who that's Kim Arnett. Uh, Kim has been an absolute breath of fresh air since she started with NAVDA. She is really responsible for managing the overall uh, day in day out um, activities of NAVDA and also interacts with, with the local chapters as well. Um, that really um, takes a load of work off the EC, which of course we're all volunteers as well too, but that's been needed for some time. And the holdup, one of the major holdups in getting NAVDA to that position was really where we stood from a financial standpoint. We, it would be irresponsible for us to, uh, we sit down every year as an executive council, look at where we are financially. And one of the key things was um, we want to make sure that when we hire somebody in that position, that we can afford uh, to keep that person on both in, you know, salary benefits and all encompassing position. We, what was linked to the strategic plan was growing NAVDA, growing our membership, growing our number of chapters so that we have that base of revenue so that we're comfortable in moving to that next step. So that was probably the thing that I'm the most proud of being part of in my time as director of promotions, because I was heavily linked to a lot of those things that are in the strategic plan as far as growing our membership, growing uh, the, the educational opportunities from, for chapters and really um, really strengthening the organization, right? It's, it's you, you, that we had to get to that point to hire Kim and uh, we're, we're now there. So that's, it's a, it was a big goal. It was, a, there was a lot to it, um, but, but we delivered on that, you know, this, this year. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of being involved in that. Just a few interactions that I've had um, with Kim. I mean, she's been amazing. She's, she's on it. <laughs> she is, <laughs> she she is really, on it. It's great. Uh, Sharp as a tack. She really yes. is very, very witty, you know, person. And she, she, her resume and her interviews, she, it was very clear that she was the right person for NAVDA. So we're looking to forward to having her on board, you know, yeah. for many, for many years. Yeah. And as the organization just continues to grow, what are some of the goals in this position as vice sure. president? Yeah. So one of the things that, um, probably most MAVDA members, you know, they wouldn't see directly or hear directly is, you know, our, our executive council members, um, we really operate in a way where, uh, you know, I have my own personal views of where, what maybe we should do as an organization, but it's really a joint effort. It's, it's a working board of members that work together for common goals. You know, no one person has more voice than the others. Uh, we, um, really heavily rely now on groups of committees, um, that we've set up. We actually have over 50 people um, that are working on various committees, you know, invitational committee, promotions committee, um, IT infrastructure committee, the judging and testing committee. There's, there's over 50 people also working behind the scenes for NAVDA on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have, we've expanded that greatly as far as um, how that goes. So, you know, my goals that I have as vice president are shared similarly, similarly, particularly with Tim Otto, the, the gentleman who's running for president. One of those goals is that strategic plan that we have is ending now. It's, it was a three-year plan. So we really need to start that process over again. Not, not maybe completely start it over, but really update that strategic plan um, to understand where we are now, three years. Now we need to do that because it's a responsible thing to do. We need to sit down as a board we need to get input from all our stakeholders, which means our committee members. More so, probably important than anything is to get input from local chapters and our members, which we did that um, as well when we developed our 2018 strategic plan. Uh, we provided the chapter members an opportunity uh, to directly put items in the strategic plan, and that was done actually at that 2019 annual meeting that we talked about a little earlier. Uh, we're probably going to expand on that this time. We're going to actually probably put some surveys together uh, as well as provide, um, you know, a workshop type of atmosphere at the annual meeting uh, to get input from, from members. It's really important that um, it's not just the executive council uh, making decisions on where the direction of the organization goes. We're going to do it um, in, a, in a joint way where, where every, all the stakeholders in the organization have a say 
in what happens. But one of the things that's really important now that probably will be in that strategic plan is making sure that our infrastructure matches the growth of the organization. So infrastructure is kind of a boring word, right? Um, but what I mean by that is really the things that behind the scenes make the organization tick at the, at the international level. Um, that would be our IT infrastructure. All our data now, the really um, detailed data that you use as a breeder uh, to get dog information, uh, that's now all cloud-based. I, rem I remember when I first visited the office, which is now the old office in Illinois, I went into the break room and right on or next to the coffee maker was the server that all the data is <laughs> held on. So I'm like, okay, we could improve this a little bit. And don't get me wrong, the office has done an exceptional job, but it, it just shows you how much the organization has grown. You know, our director of yeah. IT, Randy Hansen, who's on the board, you know, he kind of managed that whole process to get all our data cloud-based. Uh, we need to keep making sure that those processes that members and chapters use are user-friendly. Our website is user-friendly. Um, you know, that's just the way of the world is technology. And I think Navda can expand um, in, in a lot of ways um, in that front. So that is, that's one of many um, strategic priorities, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be um, probably implemented by the future EC is uh, development of a new strategic plan and, and really, really, really sitting down. And I think the thing for us, and this is actually in our current strategic plan is to dream big, but act responsibly, right? Mm -hmm. That's that we need to really think about big ways that NAVDA could go forward, but act responsibly on them. Think, think them through and think about who's going to be doing the work. If we can support that workload, do we need to bring in other people from the local level to support that workload? You know, it's, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of everything, you know, and having been through that process uh, myself the last three years um, and executing that, I think that I would provide, I provide a, a unique perspective on getting that next plan in place, you know, potentially as the new vice president. Yeah. And you're keen on with your current position of just the different partnerships that are so important, crucial really to, to the organization in general. And can you touch a little bit on that? On Sure. Sure. Yeah. As, so as director of promotions, you know, my other responsibility, which is a big bulk of my work is really to to make sure that our sponsors and conservation partners, you know, see value in the organization. I've been, we've been really fortunate with um, the sponsors that we have, that they have been long time, really meaningful sponsors. Um, you know, the time that they've been with us is extraordinary. Um, they're not just the come and go type of sponsors. And those are the type of people that we look for those long-term meaningful, you know, relationships that are going to be for years and years. Um, so that's my responsibility to manage those things, um, as well as our conservation partners, Rough Grouse Society and Pheasants Forever. We have contractual agreements with each one of those, and, and um, it's, my, it's my responsibility to manage those contractual agreements. What we also do is we look for smaller type partnerships, so organizations that can support the organiz uh, our, our events. Uh, Cabela's is a great example of one of those. They have been exceptional to work with the last four or five years. Um, they've gone out of their way to support our annual meeting and our invitational, providing items for those, which has helped NAVDA and the local chapters greatly. Those little small relationships or event sponsors for, um, for items uh, like the annual meeting and, and the invitational are, are really key. Uh, we've done some pretty innovative things um, you know, for our judges uh, recently. We, we started a program that gives some discounts for outdoor products to our judges. So that, you know, I, again, I mentioned our judges it's a labor of love with no, no money back in their pocket, but if we can provide them some support in some way, we, we've done that recently. Um, you know, and I think when we think of partnerships, we, we don't, we, we think of companies or we think of, you know, conservation groups, which is absolutely um, critical. We, we also need to think about ways that NAVD International can partner and support our local chapters more right? There, there's always a desire from a local chapter. You know, I've been fortunate because I've been a local chapter president. So I, I see the needs of what a local chapter is or what they are on a daily basis. One of the things that International has done is we've developed um, a number of support programs, the new chapter assistance program, financial support for new chapters that want to start up. 
training seminar assistance program. NAVDA provides money assistance if a chapter wants to bring in a well-known trainer of their choice to the chapters. Uh, we just started a mentor program, an official mentor program for, our, for to get new apprentice judges, um, and that helps them financially. You know, the, the NAVDA chapters have been doing that. Uh, there's a lot of chapters for, that have been doing that for year after year. You know, if a judge would come, sometimes the chapters say, don't worry, you know, don't, we'll, we'll pick up the cost of, you know, we're not, don't worry about it. An apprentice comes and, you know, somebody, they put them up somewhere, you know, that there's been so many gracious things the chapters have done over the years and local chapters have started to provide their own apprentice program. NAVD International is doing that now. And, you know, I think part of the uh, EC's responsibility is to make sure that those, those programs are meaningful. They're actually mm -hmm. doing, they're actually accomplishing the goals of those programs. And, and we'll sit down as an EC and really dive into those programs every year. And if we need to adjust them or tweak them a little bit to be more meaningful, we definitely want to do that. So, you know, it's a partner when you use the word term partnership, you know, I, my, my role has been unique. I think previously in, in NAVDA, when people know of the director of promotions, they just think that I'm responsible for dealing with the sponsors, but really kickstarting that strategic plan three years ago, I honestly, my workload has been focused largely in, in, uh, strengthening, strengthening the organization overall per our, per, per our strategic plan. So um, it's a, it's a demanding position for sure, it, but it's been fun at the same time. Yeah. Well, and I can appreciate your, your respect and your perspective there with the long-term relationships. Too many times you just see how partnerships and sponsors are just there for one year, then there's just turnover and turnover. And like, there's just something to be said about reputation and integrity and, and partnering with companies that truly appreciate and have a mutual respect for each other. So thank you for touching on that. And with that new uh, apprentice program that you guys kind of kicked off with the it would be like a scholarship of sort, or what are you calling that? Yeah, so um, it's the uh, apprentice support program. Okay. So if, if you say, Courtney, you wanted to become a judge and you want to apply to that program, um, you have to go through the apprenticeship. Um, and once you complete your apprenticeship and get approved as a judge, there's some money that NAVDA will pay you back, you know, to help okay. support your costs that you had overall, you know, during that time period where you were working through the apprenticeship. Um, we also support one of the requirements to become an apprentice is to go through the Ames Clinic, which is an all encompassing clinic about the NAVDA testing system. Uh, we're waiving those apprentices fees to get into that program. Again, you know, once they once they become a judge, we want people. It's kind of like, you know, practicing what you preach. We're, we're going to support them once they finish that process and, and are accepted as a judge. So there's a whole application process. We've actually had the most apprentices we've ever had in the program this year. Um, it's been exceptional. I mean, there's, there's a lot. Yeah. Of so that's great. That's going to help support chapters in a large way. Yeah. Um, How many have signed kind of signed up for this since you guys announced that? Gosh, I think um, we haven't, I'd say probably maybe a dozen or so somewhere in there, you know, we get apprentices that come in, that come into the program throughout the year, you know, once they meet mm -hmm. the requirements for the number of dogs or, you know, get the, the, the real nitty gritty requirements, um, then they may put their application in. So I think we'll look at those statistics um, in detail when all our officers report um, all our activities at, at the annual meeting. We typically do that every year. So we'll, we'll dive into really how, you know, that program is really doing. And again, if it, if it, if it's not helping, if it's, if we see that it's, you know, it's going to take a little time to see how that program is. It might take a year or two a day of data to show like, is this, is this really increasing the number of judges? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that and adjust it if it, if it needs to. Okay. Amanda, what's your perspective on this is kind of a outsider, but insider of, of what you all see Andy doing for the organization and what he's putting into it. And yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy to like be an outsider and just watch. Like, I don't think people really understand how much work it goes into being at that level um, because he works a full-time job at, uh, and he 
comes home at night and he is, there are some nights where like, I hardly get to talk to him because he's literally on the phone doing nav to business in the evenings and, or he's emailing. And so he's, it's like another full, it's like another, at least another part-time job. And if yeah. you considered like the judging, you know, how much he judged, then it probably would be like another full-time job that is unpaid. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, right. But it's just, you know, I get why he does it because I do it too. And I just totally understand it. Like we love the organization. We both love it. So it's easy for me to support how much he, how much time he spends doing it because I get it, you know, like it's given us so much in terms of like friendships and uh, amazing memories with our dogs and helping other people and like making new friends and stuff like through this whole thing. And, um, so it, but it is, it's hard. It's the whole, you know, election thing is, is that's tough, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's rewarding. Like it really, you know, just seeing how hard he's working and stuff and like, you know, it, it's definitely, it's, it's just different. It's a different perspective being on the outside for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you touched on that. Like just being able to put in of what it is that you're getting out of the organization in general. And you, yeah. you can't it's it's, personal. like it's, it's definitely, extremely, it's, it's hard to like quantify it because like we genuinely love like helping, like he gets, you know, when he's judging, he gets to see how, you know, excited people are when they get that score that they, you know, uh, and then when you're training with someone and you see their dog, the light bulb comes on and that person is like screaming for joy and you're screaming with them. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's definitely that's in a, like just stripping it down. That's why we do it. And so it's easy, you know, for me, it's like, okay, I'll support you know, your endeavors for that, for the, you know, because it, you you see those small, you see those glimmers of, um, you know, people that are just so pleased with their dog. Right. I remember, um, I was talking to actually Tim Otto this earlier this year, and he said, one of the, one of the funnest experiences he had judging this year was watching a woman, uh, who got a prize three with her NA dog and the scores were red. And she was crying, you know, in absolute joy. I mean, this was the best day she ever had. It wasn't on about the scores, about the fact that she had accomplished something with her dog, right? And that's, I think that's sometimes we forget about that, right? As, as, you know, handlers and judges and stuff. Yeah, we're, we all want the best out of our dog, but we, um, we forget sometimes that it's just really kind of enjoying the journey, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I judged a gentleman out, in uh utah that same test we were we were talking about earlier this year and gosh he was so nervous he came up to me and he's like i've never done this before you know this is my first he had a poodle pointer and you know i gave him some you know the word don't worry we'll be there as judges to answer your questions and the chapter will help you where you need to be and all this stuff and he was just so nervous the whole day but his dog went out there absolutely mopped up the field. I mean, must have, must literally clean the field for us. I think we had probably like <laughs> nine or 10 trucker out there that were still left over from the first dog found everyone slammed every point. You know, it was all we we're all the judges were just looking at each other, like going, okay, this is, you know, the, the wheels are really in motion for this guy today. And he did really well on his track and he did really well on his water. And he was just he was smiling all day. He was appreciative. He didn't, he enjoyed the experience. No, he enjoyed the journey, right. Mm-hmm. That he had. And at the end of the day, you know, he read a max score for his dog and he just, you know, dog jumps up in his lap and they're kissing each other. And it's just something you look at, you go, okay, that's kind of silly, but oh my gosh, that's so meaningful. That's you know? what it's about. Yeah. yeah. And um, those, that's why, you know, I've been asked many times, like, why, why do you do, why do you do things at the level that you're doing them? Right. Why does any NAV member that's involved heavily at the local or international level just continue to give their time? And it's because of those experiences. I mean, we all enjoy, you know, seeing our dogs perform and then taking them hunting and seeing that performance pay off in hunting. But 
it's just like, it's the, it's those memories you're going to make. It's the journey that you have with people that you're friends with, right? It's just really something special. And, and, and I've told many times to Amanda and other of my close friends, like we always have to make sure that we're keeping that in perspective, that it's about, that's what we're going to remember, right? We're going to remember the journey, not necessarily, you know, all the accolades or this or that. We're going to remember that process with people, you know? Yep. The friendships made, the bond that strengthens with your dog over the more you do with them. Absolutely. What does the rest of your guys' hunting season look like? Well, we hope to get out duck hunting. We usually try and hunt, duck hunt in Maine. The season for our zones opens up early October. So we duck hunt for about a week, try and take as much time. And then we, we're fortunate to own some uh, camp and some property in northern Maine that we spend a lot of time grouse and woodcock hunting in. We got into some really good woodcock hunting this year, found a new spot. And it was just one of those weeks where you're just like, man, this is just, I feel like I'm in heaven right now. And, uh, but now, you know, the season's kind of, it's, grouse will be still open all the way through December 31st. So we'll dabble in that a little bit here and there. But he also deer hunts too. Yeah. So that kind of takes a little bit of time away, like from we, what he does. Yeah. We balance, she, she nags on me a little bit, you know, cause I'm like, oh, I want to go deer hunting. You know, so she's like, I want to go bird hunting. So we got to balance that. You know, I was just out, out deer hunting opened actually yeah. just last weekend in Maine here. So, um, you know, I was out with my family deer hunting, which is something that I also have done with my dad since, you know, I could carry uh, a BB gun. He had me carrying a BB gun, you know, but it's cool. Like we, we, we definitely, we've gotten out with both our dads. So my dad now has a poodle pointer. So we've been helping him (laughs) and we we got to go out with both our dads and stuff. Yeah. Uh, So hopefully. How fun. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And a, a deer does tend to fill the freezer a bit quicker than, yeah, does. than birds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no question. No question. I mean, if you're not, yeah, there's something to be said about that for sure. What is each of your uh, favorite piece of gear that you would not go without, whether it's dog training or hunting? Yeah, I have a pair of Huntsmith chaps that I ordered like eight years ago and I still have them and they're ripped to smithereens and they look like hell but (laughs) they are my favorite things because I'm always also like I'm always cold so they just give me like a little bit extra warmth and then I'm just I'm good to go and yeah I don't have my chops (laughs) get through anything because it's it's grouse hunting you're definitely like there's times where you're just like crawling through crap and (laughs) yeah yeah it's it's tough (laughs) So. Yep. Well, what about you, Andy? For me, it's actually, uh, I have a lot of different like vests and I do only use one gun, you know, bird hunting, one gun, duck hunting, but I am never, ever not wearing a pair of darn tough socks. I don't know if you know that company out of Vermont. So I do. I, yeah. They, <laughs> I, you know, it's my personal opinion, but I lived in Vermont for one year and that's when I, um, started wearing those socks and you know, they're Merino wool. They, they, really are comfortable. They wick moisture the most, you know, my entire sock drawer is filled with nothing but darn tough socks. So, um, <laughs> you sound and, like my husband. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, it, to me, I mean, I could get, you know, I could get by with hunting with a different vest for a day or different gear, but I will always have a pair of darn tough socks. Yeah. That return policy. I think my husband's taking advantage of that almost every year. Yeah, I mean that's pretty imp- it's pretty impressive. The return policy, basically socks socks for life if you want them. Yeah. Right, right. Um, what's your guys' favorite way to prepare a game bird? What's your favorite recipe? So we we again primarily grouse and woodcock hunters if we're hunting upland, right? Um, it's really kind of a woodcock, right? They they feed on groundworms, right? So they're the breast meat is a heartier meat. It's a little more people describe it as a livery taste. Um so we kind of dabbled really hard year after year trying to find just a consistent good woodcock recipe. So what I do is if I shoot a couple woodcock, um would if I shoot a couple woodcock, I usually try and clean them right away. Uh like if we get back to the truck. Um, I'll breast off the meat off the bone and I actually keep the legs too. I don't know if you ever okay. had woodcock legs. I haven't there. So woodcock is one of the few 
um, avian species that actually has dark meat and the, the mm -hmm. legs are white, white meat, right? Um, so um, one of the game birds that, that has, has that combination. So um, what we do is we clean the, the legs, take the breast off. I will pan sear in just a little olive, um, olive oil, garlic, and a meat seasoning, like it just kind of like a prime rib rub or something that's like a meat seasoning pan sear that. So it's, uh, the breast. So it's basically just rare or medium rare at the most. Yeah. And then, rare. um, we'll serve that as an appetizer and then we'll take the legs and I'll season the legs. Cause they're kind of like a little tiny chicken wing. I'll season it with uh, a chicken seasoning and do the same thing, pan fry that. Mm. So you have just a little bit of a, I, we usually eat that as an appetizer before, like we cook a grouse or have dinner at camp. Yeah. That sounds amazing. I've had people to, it's really all about how, you know, just like most game, you know, not overcooking it, but mm -hmm. I have had people that I've given it to them, you know, family members that have tried woodcock over the years and they, they, you know, think that it tastes like an old leather livery rubber boot, mm -hmm. but they try that and they've actually tricked them and they think that it's like beef. Wow. Yeah. Good work. And it's, it, then it would be, woodcock would be the same as I, I guess our snipe here then. Um, just yep. lightly done. Yeah, exactly. I've cooked mm -hmm. snipe the same way before. Okay. Uh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I loved having you. <laughs> I can't wait to get together again. Maybe at I the know. maybe at the annual meeting. Yeah, we'll be there. It's in South Dakota this year. I think it's going to be really well attended. You know, we haven't had an in-person annual meeting for NAVDA because obviously of COVID. Uh, last couple of years, but in, in being in the central part of the U.S., I think we're just going to have a ton of people. So it's going to be a blast. Yeah, it'll be great. And I definitely want to try to do a road trip out to Montana when you guys do your her upland stuff. Yeah, I, I would love for you to come out. Um, I'll get you dates on that as soon as I have okay. them. <laughs> um, how can listeners connect with you guys? See what you're up to and your dogs and your hunting endeavors. Yeah, we're both on we're both on Facebook and we like to, you know, occasionally show, you know, some of the success we have with our dogs there. So just search for my name or Amanda's name. Um, you can look for my if a NAVDA member wants to get a hold of me, um, you can look up right on the contact section of the NAVDA International website and just look under the contacts for director of promotions. My promotions NAVDA email is right there. I, I love hearing from people and, and interacting and you know, if you if you're in Maine or you want to look us up on the Sebastian Cook website too, you know we have all our contact information there as well. Yeah, phone too, numbers, so. yep. emails. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. Be sure to get your vote in for the NAVDA International Board before November 16th. To learn more what's happening at Her Upland, the 2023 events we have planned, and the awesome apparel and swag, head over to herupland.com and be sure to subscribe to the newsletter. Also, be sure to check out the sponsors of this podcast, Purina Pro Plan, Boss Shot Shells, Onyx Hunt, and partners Siren Shotguns and Dakota 283. And don't forget to support the conservation organizations of the birds that you chase after and the public lands in which you hunt. <laughs>